Sounds good. Um, let me just do a quick introduction. So, hey everyone, welcome back to another virtual shadowing session. Today we have two amazing people with us and they will be giving us two different perspectives, one on being a dental student and the other as a practicing dentist. So I know I'm really excited. So whenever you guys are ready, just take it away. Yeah, no, thank you. We wanted to thank you guys and everyone who's here to, to taking the time out and uh, listening to this, you know, and uh, and taking down pointers because, uh, you know, hopefully it all helps us out and, uh, and you guys have a nice, smooth uh, transition forward. OK, so we're going to get started. Um, so first thing is we're going to introduce ourselves. My name is Dr. Shion Baig. I am a practicing uh, dentist in downtown San Francisco. And I'm student Dr. Hadra Chaudhary. I'm a fourth year dental student um, at LECOM and I'll be giving you my perspective. So the way my school works is we do three years in Bradenton, Florida. And then our fourth year, we have two options. We can stay in Florida or Erie. So I chose Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm right, I'm here right now. Um, and then I'll be graduating in June. Yeah. So we're just going to go a little bit, you know, about uh, what's going to be in uh, today's presentation. So some of the things that we're going to talk, talk about is, of course, the main important thing is how to become a strong candidate for dental school, right? Um, and we're going to give you a little bit of uh, uh, bits on how life is during dental school, how life is after dental school, and, uh, you know, how to transition from like dental school to the real world. So some of those, some of those are very important things. So let's, we're, we're going to start off by giving both of our ideas on uh, how to become a strong candidate. So I'm going to let uh, uh, Dr. Chaudhary start. Okay, so to become a strong candidate for dental school, um, it's pretty much the same as you hear like everywhere else, right? Like the main first thing you have to focus on is your grades. Of course, keep your grades up. That doesn't mean you have to have like a 4.0 if you get a B, like, oh my God, you're done for, right? Like people get in with, you know, even Cs and maybe even sometimes Ds. You have to be able to explain I mean, I'm not saying straight Ds, but like if you mess up in a class and you redeem yourself, that's okay. Um, but you overall have to show that you're strong academically. Um, of course, study for the DAT, do really well on that. Um, and then everything else is just like a mix of everything. There's no like, you know, recipe that you can follow to ensure that you'll get in. Um, as long as your grades are good and your DAT score is good, um, any other activity that you do will help. Of course, shadowing, you have to have some dental experience. I was actually on the uh, pre-med route. Um, and up until my senior year, I thought I was going to medical school. So I had a lot of experience like shadowing neurosurgeons and um, you know all kinds of doctors but or physicians, but I was not anywhere in the dental field. And once I decided, um, I started dental assisting. Um, that really helped me understand like if I would be fit to work in a dental office, if I enjoy it, if I like that environment, because for me, like the hospital environment was just not where I wanted to be. Um, so I chose dentistry over that, but I also like didn't want to just choose because I was like, oh, it's just clinic versus like, you know, hospital, but I wanted a shadow. I wanted to experience that. So I did, and I got my shadowing hours. I got work hours, but anything other than that, like if you do a mission trip, you don't have to do a dental related one. I did a mission trip. It wasn't dental related. Um, I actually did it through Highland support. And we basically went to Guatemala and made like stoves for a woman to cook, you know, faster so they can do other things. So you, as long as you're well-rounded, I mean, you don't have to do a mission trip either. You know, I remember like going on my parents, like I have to go, like, this is going to make or break my career. Like nothing is really going to make or break your career other than your grades. Um, anything else you do is extra. So just pick and choose, make it well-rounded. Don't do everything dentistry, but don't also not do anything dentistry. Kind of just keep a balance. Um, life during dental school, honestly, I'll be honest. Like when I applied, I was like, oh, I got through the hardest part. I got in, like, I'm good. You get there and it's a reality check really fast. Like you cannot lose determination once you get there because now the hard work really starts, right? Like getting in, I know it sounds like in retrospect, like I'm like, I look back and I'm like, that was the easy part technically, right? Like, yeah, it's stressful, but once you get in, you really have to work hard and you have to keep up with your grades. That's not to say that, oh, if you fail something, you're done for, of course. Um, schools want to keep you in. They want you to graduate, most schools, you know? Um, so, I mean, you just work hard, you get there, you wake up every day, you go to sim lab, you go to school, you follow, like the schedule is pretty tough, but if you made it that far, then you can handle it, you know? So 
it's just like any other school. You just get into a routine and that's what you do. Yeah. I mean, that was pretty much really summed up. Well, I'll give you my take on like how I kind of went through the process. So again, being a strong candidate for me for dental schools is definitely, again, main thing comes down to is your grades, your GPA and your DAT score. So that for everyone should be like the first thing that you're focusing on having a competitive DAT score, having a competitive GPA. Now each school kind of has a different, uh, um, I would say, uh, scores that they would consider competitive. So, you know, you have to do your due diligence and do your research like, hey, if this is my goal, this is my, my, my dream school, what are the competitive applicants, uh, you know, getting as far as grades go, GPA goes and everything. Um, so that is definitely the number one thing, right? That's what school um, sees uh, when they are looking at your application. The next thing is, of course, being a well-rounded um, applicant. So doing, whether it's research, whether it's shadowing that you guys are doing right now, uh, something that shows like, hey, we're, 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 we're well-rounded. Um, I, uh, so I went to University of Pacific Dental School. It was a three-year program, accelerated program, I think so far. Still, it's the only accelerated program in the nation. So instead of four years of uh, dental school, you do it in three, but the curriculum is still a four-year curriculum. So it's a lot faster paced. Um, so things can get challenging. But again, when the school is looking at everything, when they see your application, they are uh, calling you for interviews or accepting you, whatever it may be, because they think, hey, you are a good fit for the school. So that's what you guys have to show. Hey, yes, we can make you know the A's happen. Yes, we can uh, have our GPA high. Yes, we can score a really uh, high score in DAT. But hey, we can also be involved in the community. Your goal has to be to help uh, to help people. That's why you guys are choosing to be in the, the career. That's why we're in the career. Our end goal is to, yes, to become a dentist, but to really help the community, help people uh, fix their oral health, help, help people uh, live a healthier lifestyle. So that's the main thing, right? So uh I think the transition is like, you kind of have to see like where, like you're transitioning from undergrad to dental school now. Now you're going to professional school. So now you have to see what the school expects of their students, right? So in his case, he went to an accelerated program. They want to see people who can work in that kind of environment. Can they handle the stress? Can they, because I mean, dental school already is hard. And in three years, that, that makes it harder. Yeah. So you have to appeal to them, right? And then when you, if you go to a different school, you have to see what they are looking for and try to make yourself seem like you can fit in there and not just make yourself, but if you feel like you're a good fit. Exactly. And again, at, at, and that's a good point because when you are going to, let's say when you guys do apply, you guys have good DAT scores, good GPA, you guys also have to see, hey, uh, the school gave me an interview. Yes, the school is interviewing you as a potential student dentist, but you should be also interviewing the school. Is this a good fit for me? You know, that is a, a big key. Um, and there were instances where I went to interview and I was like, you know what, amazing school. Maybe I don't, I, maybe I don't see myself here, um, you know, succeeding as a, as a student dentist versus at another place where I'm like, hey, I really do feel like I will do well here. So it's, your guys's options as well. It's not just a dental school picking and choosing. Of course, that's what it seems like when you're going through the process, but make sure whatever you choose, whatever dental school it is, where, whichever area of the country it's in, it's, it's a good fitting place for you guys as well. That is, that is an important factor in, in, in that category as well. Okay. But if you get into one, definitely go, don't yes, be picky, don't, but if you yeah. have options, then look, <laughs> then look, of course, of course. So we're just going to, again, kind of go into the next uh, step. Uh, again, we both kind of mentioned our dental school that we went to, again, University of the Pacific uh, Dental School. It, uh, the dental school uh, UOP is called, it's located in downtown San Francisco. Um, I am from San Francisco, so I got lucky enough to get to the same uh, school that uh, in the city I'm from. Um, I went, I did my undergraduate degree uh, at San Francisco State University. Um, and my major was uh, biology and uh, I minored in chemistry. Okay, so I went to VCU for undergrad, which is in Virginia, um, Richmond, Virginia. And I actually applied all over the East Coast when I was applying to dental school. I didn't care. I wasn't like picky about like where I went. I was like, I just want to know what the program offers. Mm -hmm. So when I went for interviews, I actually thought like, I didn't really even have a first choice. I would say I was kind of just like, I want to go somewhere that's going to be a strong program, right? Because 
the dentist I worked for as a dental assistant was like, just get into the cheapest school you can go to. At the end of the day, you're all going to graduate the same, but you will understand that like you're going to graduate with so much debt. So it doesn't matter as long as the program is strong. So I applied all over. Um, my options were either in New York or Florida. Um, and I didn't, I mean, my parents wanted me to choose Florida for the weather, but for me, I really didn't think I was going to go to Lecom. That was kind of just like after I, inter after I interviewed is when I realized I was like, okay, you know what? I actually like it here. I felt like I fit in there. So that's why I ended up choosing it. But once I got the interview, like once they told me to come for the interview, I was like, okay, like I'll see. But I was, I thought I was headed to New York. Um, but you kind of, that's what he was saying earlier. Like you kind of have to see where you're going to fit in. And my parents kept saying, like, no, just choose Florida. Just go. It'll be better. But I did interview and then I realized like, okay, you know what, this is a better fit for me. So that's where I went. I didn't choose based off of my location, um, but I ended up in Florida because that's, you know, the school I ended up choosing. But I also my, uh, majored in biology and minored in chemistry at VCU. Um, and I think I touched on deciding factors for dental school. You can talk about residency and then I'll talk about it. Yeah. So, I mean, well, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit before that. I mean, kind of just kind of retouching on what uh, what Hadra said is basically when you guys are applying, applying, you guys have to make sure you guys are applying uh, broadly. Yes. Right. Don't just apply to one school. You guys have to be smart because you are competing with, you know, at, at least minimum 2000 applicants who are applying into each specific school. So you guys have to create uh you know, some kind of a range, hey, like I'm looking in the East Coast, I'm looking in the West Coast, I'm looking here, there, like you guys have to make a number of, uh, of uh, decisions on which schools you guys want to even look forward to applying to. So again, and then doing your doing your research based on those schools, never apply to one school. My transition, I mean, um, you know, as I was uh, saying earlier, um, so the way, again, when you have a strong DAT score, you have a strong GPA. Um, also, don't just hold back and be like, oh, I'll just, you know, maybe I'm not ready yet. Maybe I'll apply next year. Maybe this year is not my time, whatever it may be. When I was applying, I, 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 that's exactly what was going on in my mind. I was not supposed to apply the year that I did because I took the DAT pretty late. So as you guys are probably aware, the applications start, um, I believe, uh, in the beginning of June. So ideally, you want to get everything in right when the applications open up. The letter of recommendations, the DAT scores, the, the, the whole application finished, your, your, your transcripts, everything. For me, that wasn't the case. I, I, I had everything set besides the DAT. My DAT, I was taking almost two months after the applications, it was a late August. So my application wasn't completed an, until like October. So that's fairly late, um, you know, considering when the application opened up. So I was like, hey, should I even apply this cycle? Should I wait? Whatever it may be. Last minute decision, I was like, you know what? Let's just go for it and see what happens. I ended up getting into the school of my choice, uh, plus other schools as well. I, I applied to, I think at least 10 to 12 schools. Um, again, ended up getting a good amount of interviews as well. So again, that's the other thing is don't doubt also, uh, don't doubt yourself, make sure uh, that you guys are applying as a, as a strong candidate and have those strong things that we talked about as far as grades go, DAT goes, and then just, and, and then, uh, you know, think about, okay, is this, is this the right time for me to apply? If it is, if you're doubting it, see why you're doubting it. If everything is set and you're just nervous about it, don't worry, just go for it and see what happens. You will be, you will, you guys will succeed. You guys will take that step forward. And do not go on online forums. Okay. Yeah. I know everyone likes to do it. And I honestly should not even be giving this advice because I did that so much. I did it myself. <laughs> but it literally makes you think that you need to have like the perfect everything or mm -hmm. else you won't get it. Yes. I also took the DAT really late because as I said, like I was, I decided very late that I was going to be, a, that I was going to go to dental school. So I was like, okay, let me shadow and stuff. Let me work as a dental assistant. I already knew at that point I was taking a gap year. So I was like, okay, I might have to take another gap year because I don't know, whatever. And like, when I scheduled the DAT, I was very nervous. I was like, oh, I'm not ready. Oh, I'm not ready. Like I kept doing that. And I kept pushing it. I kept pushing it. I actually took it in September. And so it was like, we're not saying take the DAT late. Of course, of course. if you can take it earlier and you're sure, take it early. Ideally, you want to turn in your application early, but if for some reason something gets in the way or something happens and it gets delayed, it's not like you won't get in. And I actually have a friend who ended up uh, retaking the DAT in December and she got in into five schools, I think, of like top 
you know, top choice schools. So it's not to say that you won't get in. And if you read those forums, they will tell you if you don't have a 4.0 and a perfect DAT score, and you have not traveled the whole world uh, providing free work or whatever, you will not get in. Like that's literally what they make you think. Yeah. And it really puts you in a negative headspace. So don't do that. Try to avoid that. Just have confidence and just apply and go for it. Yeah. What's the worst that could happen, right? Like you might not get in this time, but you will get in eventually. Being, being persistent, showing the schools that, hey, we are interested in this career. We're interested in helping people. That is the main thing. That's what schools want to see. Like, hey, this person is determined. They want to move forward. They want to build a better career um, and, and move dentistry forward. That is a that is a big thing, right? So so that's the thing. Being persistent and 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 just kind of going for it and see where you guys uh, you know head to. And I think the point that Dr. Ray made earlier about applying broadly is so so important because you have to realize that you're taking a chance on a year of your life, right? Because then the next cycle opens the following year. You're already investing a little bit of money. Why not invest more in your future and save yourself that time also? Yeah, it might not guarantee you'll get in, but it gives you higher chance, right? So I applied very broadly. I was like, I'm applying everywhere on the East Coast. Like, I don't care where it is, I'll go, you know? And I did. And I feel like that gave me a lot of opportunities and a lot of interviews. And I was able to go and I was able to have options. Um, you know, even if you think you're a strong candidate, that isn't everyone who's applying at some point thinks they're a strong candidate, right? So it's not, it doesn't make you look like a weak candidate. I remember like going to interviews and people telling me like, oh, how many, uh, like asking me like, oh, how many schools did you apply to? Oh, that's too many. They're going to think like you're not so confident or you're, they, mm -hmm. they make you think that, but that's not how it is. You know, you are applying to secure your future. If a school thinks that I'm applying to so many schools and my grades are there and they think I'm not a strong candidate because I applied to so many schools then I don't want to go to that school, you know? So that's okay. Like apply broadly. This is your future. Yeah. And, uh, and you know what I mean? Like we're, we're also, I, I also want to kind of touch base a little bit with as far as the DAT, because that, again, that is the main thing when it comes down to uh, applying to dental school. So I'm just going to touch up, a, you know, really be, uh, like a little quickly on what, you know, how you guys should study for the DAT, how, how, like what I did, what, what, what doc, uh, student Dr. Chaudhry did. Did. So uh, as far as studying for the DAT is definitely seeing, um, setting up a timeline, um, sitting down, making a, making a calendar or, or some timeline. Hey, I'm going to start this day. I'm going to give myself X amount of time to, to study for this and uh, divert your time into the different subjects, which are within the DAT. Um, so the way I did, I start off with biology because for me, that was the stronger subject. Um, bi biology is one of the, the more uh, larger subject in the DAT, has the most questions, of course, being from the, the biology background. I'm like, okay, well, I can start off with that. And I know as time moves forward, I will still retain some of that information because that's what I ended up studying. Um, I did biology. Uh, there's many, uh, many different sources. I did not just use one source for, for everything. Um, I, I remember doing biology with, with uh, the Kaplan's blue book. Um, I literally almost wrote down the whole book myself, hand, hand wrote it and just studied all that. Um, that helped me, um, you know, um, you as don't have to, do you that, don't though. have to do that. Yeah. That's just, that, <laughs> that, that, was, a little just, extreme. <laughs> that was, that that's, that's, that's going overboard. Right. <laughs> but, um, my second thing that I use for organic chemistry and general chemistry, um, I don't, I'm not even sure. If, uh, I'm sure it's still around, but, uh, <laughs> Chad's videos, Oh um, yeah, Chad's videos, amazing amazing highly recommend that uh, that's what i use for that um and then uh pat uh it was uh for the rest english comprehension pat math i i, I use the at boot camp and a couple other resources other resources just like right now youtube if i didn't understand anything you just go on youtube type in whatever you're trying to understand there's many videos about each particular tiny little subject um so again there's many different ways of studying everyone's going to study differently. Some yeah. people will study for a couple weeks. Yeah. Some people will study for a couple months. It's fine. You're not competing with someone as far as that goes. Yeah. You're, you're competing with yourself as far as time. Hey, how, how long do I want to give myself and set my schedule and study for the DAT, right? And even with dental school, as we're saying like, hey, dental school is tough. Dental school is tough. Yes, some of the classes, yes, they get a little tough. It's hard to understand. But for me personally, uh, more so the, the, the part which, which makes it tough is uh, the time management. That is what really gets tough. It's like, hey, I have to study this, this, and this all in the same day. 
So time management is more um, more of the tougher part of dental school versus like, hey, oh, this I'm, I'm taking this biochem class again. We, for the most part, a lot of you are going to study some of that, some concepts of that class already in undergraduate. And you're going to so, be able to handle that. And science. you're, you're going to be able to yeah. handle the sciences. It's, it's, that's the part that's not going to be difficult. But like I said, time management is key in dental school, especially in, in, in a case where if you're going to accelerated school, it's definitely going to be the main key. But all dental schools are for the most part same as far as curricular uh, cur curriculum goes. So time management definitely kind of tops that and as far as that goes. Yeah, and people will tell you like, oh, I study for a week or oh, I study for two weeks and I did amazing. Like don't, don't compare. compare, you have don't to block compare. the outside noise and focus, focus on your on end yourself. goal. Um, for me, I don't, I can't study like, oh my God, I'm gonna study like one subject or whatever because for me, it's so broad that I need some kind of like, you know, tunnel vision towards like what I'm studying. So I actually liked using, um, I think it's Ari's st uh, schedule or something, something ARI, something like that. I don't remember it correctly now, but I'm sure if you Google it, Ari's um, DAT schedule. Yes, and Ari's he broke right. it down with Chad's videos, DAT Destroyer, and I think boot camp. And I kind of used that and made it my own. I kind of like manipulated the schedule to work with my time timeline. Um, and that really helped me because it kind of helped me narrow down like what I'm studying. Also, like, yeah, you can use sources broadly and definitely do that. But don't go so overboard that you're spreading yourself thin and you're not actually getting the full concept. Like he said, like some subjects are strong in some like, you know, books or some sources cool, use that, but don't spread yourself so thin that you're like, oh my God, like now I haven't studied like the other subjects. So just be careful, like have a limit on what you're doing, but also kind of, you know, focus because I feel like I go down a rabbit hole and I'm like, oh my God, I need to know the background of this. And then I study that and then I Google that. It's just, it gets kind of out of control, right? So you do have to learn how to like, kind of get back to the point and just study that and just, you know, move on. Don't think like, oh, it's so much information. How am I going to get it? study what you can try your best and just take it you pick your sources and stick with them and last thing about DAT is when you guys are done studying all these different subjects make sure you guys are doing the full length practice yes, exams definitely. that is going to be the key because DAT exam it's a long exam yes. you do get drained a little bit so again time management you have to come down to hey I have to make sure I can hang in through a longer exam so you are studying for a couple hours you take breaks whatnot but in a DAT setting at the at the testing center you're right in front of a computer and you're taking a full length exam with mini breaks in between of course so again practicing that as well practicing time management with your knowledge to see hey let me do a full length practice exam do it as much as you can if possible and that will help you also within when you're taking the actual exam okay yeah and start like a week or two before don't do it just the night before and stuff because then mm -hmm. you will be drained don't do it the night before take a few exams and don't be like oh my god like i'm so scared like i i did really bad on this section go back study that section because you're taking that as a practice right i had the habit of being like oh my god like i did really bad in this section i have to go back and like I'm, I'm just going to fail the DAT now. I'm going to do so bad. My score is going to be bad. But you have to use that to your, to your advantage, right? Because that's the time you can correct it. You can't exactly. correct it on the real one. So you have to go back and you have to see like which subject you didn't do amazing in. Go back, study that. If it's all of them, cool. It's all of them. Study all of them. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to add a little bit more to that is when you're taking, when you guys are learning, doing the questions, these questions can be tough. They're very detailed questions, right? So if you're getting it wrong, don't beat yourself up over it because right now is the time to actually, if you're getting it wrong, great. You want to get it wrong right now and learn the right way, learn the correct answers so you don't get them wrong during the test, right? So again, when I was doing all these different study tools, um, so, some material, I was just like, oh man, like I am, there's no way I could do it, right? You just feel that way. That is natural. Don't beat yourself up. I did that. It, it doesn't get you anywhere, but instead use that as, okay, well, I got this wrong. Why did I get it wrong? Let me correct it. Let me learn this. And you will, and, and you will, and you will uh, get that topic right away. Yeah. And I think as someone in school right now and someone who graduated not too long ago, we will always tell you like, don't beat yourself up over things. Cause as students, you will kind of overthink, but don't let that discourage you because there's been so many times where I'm like, oh, like, I can't do this. This is so hard, but <laughs> you will be fine it's okay. Just breathe and get through it. Get Just through keep it. pushing through. Yes. All right. We're going to, we're going to move forward. About that. <laughs> yeah. DAT again, it's you guys can do it. Okay. Don't stress about that. We're going to move forward with the, with the presentation. So uh, a little bit, I guess, back to us, uh, we're going to, so I am a general dentist. I 
my focus, I like to focus a little bit, uh, a little bit more on cosmetic dentistry. So that cosmetic dentistry has to do with the front teeth, creating a smile, someone who doesn't like, you know, small little areas of their smiles or, a, or, a, or their whole full smile. How can we enhance that? Something as small as what you're seeing right here, a tiny little chip could be fixed up as if nothing happened. That is cosmetic dentistry versus some of the, the bigger procedures that you've probably seen on online or, or at other dental offices where they're doing full on veneers and whatnot. All of that kind of realms uh, comes down to cosmetic dentistry. So that's where my focus comes down to. Um, um, I personally did not uh, decide to specialize because I ended up going into dentistry because of orthodontics. Um, before before dental school, way before dental school, I, I went through the whole uh, uh, ortho procedure um, and uh, at a dental school actually. And that what really got my interest in going into the dental field. I thought, hey, maybe I'll look into ortho. Um, going in through those, into those classes, I, you know, I saw, I, I didn't see myself as an orthodontist in the long term, because as a general, I liked doing all the different types of procedures. I like doing fillings. I like doing crowns. I like doing root canals. I like doing uh, extractions. Um, so whatever the, the, the patient brings in, I like that challenge where it's kind of all over the place. Um, everyone is different. Some people have that one thing that they really love for whatever reason that may be. Um, for me, general dentistry was that. I liked, you know, just kind of being able to treat whatever I can and, and, and treat the pa patient more like comprehensively, basically. So I actually, before I went to dental school, I was like, I'm either going to do pediatrics or ortho because um, when I was applying for jobs as a dental assistant, they asked me if I could work in the pediatric department of that office because they needed an assistant there. So I started doing that and I loved it. I loved like being around the kids. It was so fun as an assistant. I was like, you know, doing their cleanings and I was like helping with the exam and like with restorative work. So I really enjoyed that. So I was like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I came into school. Um, first two years, you won't know because it's a lot of like didactic coursework and like, you know, you're not going to be doing a lot of clinical stuff. You'll be in sim lab and you'll think, oh my God, I'm going to be an amazing, you know, pediatric dentist, or I'm going to be an amazing endodontist, but plastic teeth, real teeth, way different. Um, and then humans, obviously like that whole factor of like somebody's mouth and so many different things in the clinical setting. Um, I started seeing pediatric patients and I didn't see too many. And I realized I was like, oh my God, this is horrible. Like it was fun doing cleanings, but it's not fun doing the restorative work for me at least. Right. So I didn't think that that was something that I could do every single day. And I think like, it takes like a lot of patience. Um, I love kids, but I feel like I also don't want to just go, you know, keep doing the same thing over and over every day. Um, when I was shadowing, when I was watching, you know, like the dentist do it, I think I just, I felt like it started getting like the day to day, like when I was assisting, it was fine because I was actually doing the work. I was assisting, I was doing things. It was my job. But when I was shadowing and I saw what the dentist did every day, I felt like it started becoming repetitive. Um, and then ortho, same thing. When we, when we were doing some lab stuff or when we even, I even did some ortho cases in clinic and I just felt like there wasn't enough patient interaction there. Um, and when I started doing stuff in clinic, I started realizing that I like doing a lot more than just one thing as well. And I think that's kind of what most general dentists like. If you like something a lot, you can do it as a general dentist too. You can get CE courses, you, you know, you can go take CE courses and learn more about that. But for me, I just don't want to go to work every single day and do the same exact thing every single day, you know, and I, I did like the variety as well. Yeah. And that being said, again, every specialty has its, uh, is it's, it's great things, right? So it's like, if that's when you guys get to that point, if you guys love ortho, that's then, and yeah. then, Hey, that's for you. If you guys love oral surgery, if you guys love uh, doing root canals, if you guys like a specialty push for that, because yeah. again, it's, it's not so much my experience or experience. It's what you, your guys experience is going to be within that yeah. specialty within those procedures. And that's, what's going to help you pick or choose on which direction you guys want to go. That's, that's how we made our decision, yeah. but you guys will be definitely be making those same decisions. Once you guys get there, as there's well. no right or wrong specialty. Yes, it's course. more what you can do and what you want to do. What's, I mean, there's yeah. people in my class that I'm like, no, you know what? You are cut out to like do that specialty. You should do that. Go for it. You know? Yeah. It's just, it's just what you prefer to do. There's no like right or wrong. Definitely. Definitely. 
So as far as uh, as far as the uh, practice goes, so I'm going to give you the the private uh, private uh, practice uh, point of view. Um, so again, as you guys are probably aware that I am practicing in downtown San Francisco, I am practicing as an associate right now. So what that means is I am working uh, for someone who owns the dental practice. So I'm not the practice owner. I am the working dentist there. Um, some of the some of the deciding factors when I did go out into looking for a job um, was okay. Well, what do you you know what 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 was I looking for initially for me was getting my speed up. Uh, for some people, that's what you guys are going to decide as well. What is my goal at the end of the day? Now I'm a general dentist. What do I want to do? Do I want to do I want to increase my speed? Do I want to go into a certain specialty? Um, what's your main end goal basically so if you're trying to increase your speed for me personally um i thought corporate was a good good transition for me in that sense in a corporate setting you're seeing a lot more patients in a lot faster pace clinical setting that's where your speed will definitely go up um, in a specialty sense there are some general dentists who are more focused for example in pediatrics or in oral surgery so if that's your goal, like, hey, maybe I want to look into pediatrics down the line, not right away. I want to work for a couple of years. Then I want to go into pe uh, pediatric dentistry. You can look for a practice that is more focused in pediatric dentistry. That's where you're going to get more experience again. Um, uh, so and then other than that, I mean, uh, some of the factors, some of the things when you guys, again, it's a it's a long time from now where, you know, that that, that this whole looking for a job process and everything that, you know, but it will come up sooner than you guys think. The dental school flies by before you even know it. Four years go by and you're like, oh, man, I'm, 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 I'm already done. That's what happens. Right. Um, so you guys are probably not going to remember this part when the time comes. But, you know, just just the, the, the slight uh, bits that you guys should look into when the time comes is when you are applying for jobs. There's going, there are contracts, people, uh, when you are applying for jobs, they tell you, hey, this is what your contract is. The main things that, you know, you have to look into, how's the contract looking, have someone look over the contract, preferably a lawyer, to see what this language, which is supposedly English, but you cannot understand, what does that really mean in, in normal English, in normal terms, right? So a lawyer will be able to help you out with that. Seeing how the practice's day-to-day -day schedule is, uh, how many patients you're seeing in that practice? What's the practice environment? How many how many dental assistants are there? Do I have help? Am I doing hygiene? Am I doing uh, you know? Am I doing exams only? Am I just doing restorative work? So you have to see that as well. For me, the most important part uh, when uh, picking a job was the practice uh, ethics. Um, and that what what that means is how is the practice treating patients? That is uh, the main key, and I think that should be the main key for for all of us as as healthcare providers. Is the that the at the end of the day we're coming, like I said, in this career to help patients. So that's the type of we should never forget that we learned that all through dental school. Now that we get into the dental field by ourselves, we shouldn't forget that as well. So that's a big important factor when you're working for some place. It's like do those practice ethics match match with your uh, practicing ethics for the patients as well. Okay. Um, so next, uh, student Dr. Jodhri is going to talk about the dental, uh, uh, sorry, the, the dental or actually, no, sorry. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the private office. <laughs> sorry, private <laughs> office. So my day-to-day -day schedule, private office is again, I, uh, it ranges every day is a little different. That's what, uh, that's what general dentistry is about. It, you kind of don't know what's coming into the door. <laughs> So my daily uh, schedule is from doing examinations. I'm uh, looking at radiographs, looking at x-rays, making different diagnoses uh, from, from x-rays, from looking clinically. Um, I'm doing cleanings. Now that, that could range from regular cleanings, deep cleanings. I'm doing restorative work. That could be fillings, crowns, bridges. I'm seeing emergencies. Someone just comes in and they're in a lot of pain. How can we help them get out of pain? Um, main thing is, main uh, point behind all of this in again, general dentistry or any specialty is that you're taking care of the patient's concern. What's bringing them in to the door? If they're in pain, what can we do to get them out of pain? If this is a concern, if they have a chipped tooth, what can we do to help them address that concern? Uh, the most important thing for all patients is to make them feel welcome. When they are here, you make them feel welcome, you make them feel safe, and you help them out with, with all that you can do. So that's going to be the most important part. And that's what my daily 
practice uh, um, is basically on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so I don't know anything about the practice aspect yet. I'm transitioning into that myself and I'm a little nervous because I want to see how it's going to be, you know, from school to a real office. Um, I have, you know, shadowed him as well and seen how it is, but of course you won't know every office is different. Um, but in school, uh, first two years, you really just do sim lab half day and then you do courses for the rest of the day. My school is actually a PBL based school. So problem-based learning. Um, I did not actually know about that. I did not know what that was when I was applying. I had to look into that, understand what that was and decide if that's what I wanted. Um, it's basically where they put you in a group setting. They split the class into group settings and a lot of the courses, um, they give you the books for them and they, they give you a instructor as well in that group. So you're in a group of about, I would say 10 students and a professor um, that could be a dentist or like, you know, a PhD professor in any of those subjects. Um, and they kind of help guide the, guide the session. Um, they give you a case and the case basically brings in aspects of all kinds of sciences like biochemistry, physio, everything. So basically once you're done, you know, figuring out that case, um, it's not necessarily a dental case, it's a medical case. Um, and then once you're done, any chapter that you used to solve that case, you choose that towards that case and you basically study those chapters and that's how you get tested. I know it sounds complicated, but it's, I mean, it's kind of independent learning. Um, not all of our courses were like that. Uh, we did do anatomy separately. Um, I can't even remember what else we had separately, but there are some courses that are very heavy that they're like, okay, we're going to have an instructor for that. But uh, there's several problem-based learning schools out there. So that's how our school was. So in the morning we had SimLab from like about seven-ish um, first year to like 1130. The second year they were like, okay, seven is way too early. So eight to like 12. Um, and then after that we had P lunch and then PBL. And then third and fourth year, uh, mostly clinic just all day. I mean, third year was like clinic from eight to four um, with a lunch break at 12, uh, 12 to one. This year, the way my school does it is, um, so we have morning shifts and afternoon shifts for fourth year. So morning shift was supposed to be 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. And afternoon shift, shift was supposed to be 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. But because of COVID, that was cut short. So now I'm not in clinic a lot, but we have a lot of Zoom stuff. So I am in clinic seeing like one to two patients a day. Um, third year, we saw two patients, that's it. Um, this year, we're allowed to schedule more, but because of the time crunch, we can only kind of fit in two. Um, but for the rest of it, they'll do like, you know, online Zoom stuff or things like that. But basically the first two years is gonna be a lot of sciences. Second two, or like the last two years, um, they're gonna be a lot of clinical stuff. So in your guys's case, I mean, since you guys are going to be applying into dental school, that's something, again, it comes down to doing the research on schools is uh, what is that school doing as far as with all these regulations with COVID going on and everything? What am I learning out of it? What's the curriculum like? How, how, how has it changed? What type of, uh, uh, you know, what type of things am I going to be learning when I'm out of there as a, as a practicing dentist? So that's some of the things would be an important factor, especially now because, um, you know, with me, I, 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 I graduated pre-COVID, so I didn't have to really deal with that. So I wouldn't understand the same things that you guys will be eventually going through with and, and that soon Dr. Chaudhary is going through with that, hey, with COVID, all these regulations, how things are much different now versus they were before. So that's a, that's a good part to do your research on. Call the schools, ask them questions. Because again, at the end of the day, like I said before, you guys are also interviewing the schools just as much as the schools are interviewing you guys. Yeah, and your clinical experience is what's going to help you when you get out of this, you know, out. So I think like that, that was a really good point because that's so important. There are schools, you know, that are not able to accommodate, you know, like all these students in the clinical setting. And then there are schools that are working around it and you can't do everything on zoom for dental school. You have to do hands-on experience stuff, right? So you definitely have to see what regulations they have, if they will allow you to get the, you know, proper stuff. You can't just do, you know, maybe a couple of hours of clinic and graduate and be, you know, you know, confident, um, then you might need a residency, you might need a GPR and AEGD and stuff. So definitely, definitely look into that. That's very important. Yeah. So hopefully COVID isn't around by the hopefully, time you guys have Hopefully crossing our fingers, everything will be nice and smooth in the future with vaccines going on and yes. everything. But again, do your research, see what you guys are getting yourself into, what the school yeah. is, what the policies are, and that should definitely help you make that final decision as well. So uh, we're going to just 
touch over a couple cases. Um, this is a denture case that soon Dr. Shodi is going to talk about. Um, so the reason I put this case in was because I feel like when you come to dental school, when you're outside of dental school and you're shadowing, you see regular, you know, you see a general dentist or you see a endodontist or whoever you're shadowing doing the procedures that they're doing. In a specialist case, of course, once you graduate and you become a specialist, you will be doing that exact thing. Um, but as a general dentist, what you do in dental school versus what you do in the real world is very different because a lot of the cases that will come to you in dental school um, you know, a lot dental school fees are cheaper. So it's going to be people who can't afford dental work and weren't able to get that treatment at the proper time. So now their case is extreme. You know, I'm not saying every patient will be like that, but for the most part, it will be. And if you want to do, you know, like high, you know, production cases or, you know, ex, ex, you know, really expensive treatment and stuff, a lot of the times, like patients don't even want to pay for one crown. So you're left with not doing any of the crowns. They're like, you know what, just pull the tooth for me. I don't want to pay for it. So don't let that also like, you know, let you think that like, you know, it's always going to be like this. I want to do this and I can't do that. That's not how it's going to be. That is dental school, but that's also very important because it teaches you how to tackle those kind of cases once you're out in the real world. So a denture case is perfect because a lot of patients don't accept treatment plans that cost a thousand or even more than that, like way expensive treatment plans. They don't want to get, you know, root canals done and crowns. It gets pretty expensive. So this patient wanted all his teeth extracted. Of course, we're not extracting healthy teeth, but he couldn't save them with root canals or, you know, crowns um, or bridges or, you know, whatever it may be. So he had to get all the teeth extracted because of financial reasons. Uh, we extracted all the teeth um, and ended up giving him dentures. So, you know, the before picture, I know his mustache is in the way, so you can't really see, but um, he didn't have any teeth. Um, and you can kind of just see like the smile is more full now with dentures. So this is something you would probably, you know, probably be doing in dental school. Also in dental school, the lab does not do a lot of the work for you. You will have to do the lab work as well. For me, honestly, that was so hard to grasp because I was like, I just want to do the dentistry. I don't want to do the lab work, but I think it's very important now in very retrospect. Yeah. Now in retrospect, when I look back as a fourth year, I'm like, you know what? All the professors were right. They would always be like, you know, you need to know how to do this or else you're not going to know what the lab is doing. And I'm so grateful for that now, because now that I know what they do on their end, I can do better as a clinician. So they will tell you a lot of things in dental school. They're not just saying it for no reason. It's there for a reason. So this case, I, I did learn a lot of, you know, background stuff, um, lab stuff, and just clinical things in general. Um, but uh, Dr. Big is going to talk about some of the other kind of cases that you might be seeing in a Yeah. Practice. And before I move on to my my quick little case, I will, uh, you know, I'm going to touch base on, on, on what she said. So again, in dental school, it's a lot of lab work. It's yes, a lot of lots of lot. lots of lab work. <laughs> again, when you're in that process, including myself, you're like, man, why am I doing this? I'm not going to yeah. be doing this in real life or whatever it may be. But those are dental schools. They know what they're doing, of yes. course, right? They are they are uh, teaching a ton of new dentists. So unless you know the bread and butter, unless you know how to get your hands dirty, you can't do the upper, uh, you know, the cases out in the real world. So if a, if a laboratory sends you a case, there's something wrong with it. You are the dentist, you are the doctor, you should be the one to know, hey, how can I go around it? What do I need to fix? How can I communicate with the laboratory? So those are the aspects when it comes down to when you do get out of uh, dental school, you think about it, it's like, wow, I, I'm glad I did all that work. I'm glad I, I did mount all these casts that that I, in real world, I almost have never had to do. But in dental school, that was a very common thing. So again, dental school life versus real life could vary uh, depending on where you're working, of course, as well, and what your specialty possibly is as well. Uh, but again, dental school, that's what makes it tough. These mounting these cases, going through them, setting individual teeth on all these dentures, it takes time, it comes down to time management, and you still have to study and you still have an exam the next day. So that's where it comes down to. But again, dental school, they know what they're doing. So that's where you guys have to find out again, do the research. Okay, what's, you know, what's the dental school's expect, expectation from the students? And then what am I going to be learning out of it? So these are some of the important factors. It's important well. to get through these steps exactly. to get there, you know, to get to the point but, where you, you don't have to do the, you know, to, to, to really get your hands too dirty is laboratories doing the work for you. 
but you have to go through these as, as soon as Dr. Trojic said. And I think like you will catch your own mistakes over time. I was one of those students. I was like, why am I doing this? This is like, I'm tired of pouring up casts. Like it's so trivial. Like it's so easy. I could just do it. Like you just mix the powder and you pour it up and it's so easy. <laughs> but honestly, till this day, I look back at some of my casts. I'm like, I really thought I was doing it right. Like you really do learn from your mistakes and you get better. And yeah, that's not what you will be doing in the real world. But now when a lab sends me, you know, a case back or a mounted, I can see if there is a mistake because I am the one that's treating the patient. So if the lab is doing something incorrectly, I can correct them or I can, you know, like fix that mistake myself and know what to do. Right. So it might seem like, oh, you know, it's so trivial, like I could do it, but trust me, like I was very hard headed about it. So <laughs> once you get towards the end, then you realize you're like, you know what? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And the other thing is, I mean, you know, sometimes when we, we, you guys are in the undergraduate uh, process right now, and then you go to dental school, you learn quite a lot. And then you're like, oh, now I'm a dentist. Yeah. In dentistry, in any field, to be honest, in any, any field that you want to succeed in, you have to constantly keep learning, especially in a healthcare field. Things are changing. New, new uh, technology comes out. Better ways come out. Sometimes the older ways are still much better than the newer ways. So that's where constant learning is key. You have to make sure that you guys are doing everything that's possible. Us as uh, healthcare providers, we have to make sure we're learning everything we can to treat the patients as best as we possibly can. Because at, at the end of the day, it comes down to patient care, uh, patient health, and improving overall health. So that that's going to be the main key. There. Do not get overconfident ever. Yes, yes, <laughs> I was always, actually a, like, a quick little learn. story. I was telling him, I was like, you know what? I'm so good at extractions. I can extract any tooth in the world. I'm great. Like, <laughs> And I'm the, over here like, yeah, 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 sure. I've had my fair share of heart extractions where I'm just sweating underneath that mask and everything. I'm not showing the patient <laughs> one bit that I'm struggling right now, but you know, all of us, we, we I did like a humans. couple and I thought I was like amazing. Amazing, okay, because they went smoothly. And then the very next day after I said this, it came back to me. It was the hardest one I've ever done. So don't ever get too comfortable in everything. Even if you get a hard case, you will learn something from it. I know I've done procedures. I've done a root canal where I'm like, wow, this was not bad. And then the next one is very hard. And then I'm like, okay, well, you know what? I learned from that. So don't ever get too comfortable. Always, you always are going to learn from every case that you do. Exactly, exactly. So then my next uh, thing comes down to is uh, patient management and, and looking at what the patient wants, right? So here you see uh, an x-ray, it's called a bite wing. Um, you guys are going to, when you guys go through dental school, you guys will learn how to read a radiograph. That is a very important part of diagnosing, right? So you have to see, patient comes in, what is their main concern? What is, what is their chief concern? Why are they in your chair right in front of you? Is it pain? Are their gums healthy? Do they have a big cavity happening? Uh, what's what's really going on here? There's a little bit of combination of, of all of them uh, uh, combined. If you can see my cursor, uh, I'm kind of circling around some tartar built up that is stuck around the gum line, uh, around the bone. And uh, that is gonna cause gum gum disease. It's gonna cause uh, you know bone health to not be healthy anymore. Uh, there's a dark giant circle that you see right here. That is a big cavity. This little lines that you're seeing, that is the nerve of the tooth. So um, as you can see here, if, for example, this patient comes in and their main concern is, I want to get whitening done, but you see that there is a bigger issue happening. You have to definitely address their chief concern, but you also have to see, uh, is that the first thing that I should be doing or should I get them back to healthy first? Patient education is key as well. So uh, again, that's where patient, uh, patient management comes into play is, okay, how can I tell the patient, they may not be in pain at the moment, but how can I prevent them from, uh, from uh, having an active infection, for example? If, they, if this patient comes in, they have a swelling down below and I can see some pus coming out of it, but their chief concern is I want white teeth. I just wanna do whitening. That's where as a practicing dentist, as a, as a healthcare provider, your job is to, hey, do I just address their chief concern or do I look at what's the right thing to do? And again, you do address that chief concern, but we might have to move things around. But otherwise, if, if in this case, patient comes in, hey, I'm having pain on, on my tooth, then that is the chief concern. First thing is get them out of pain. We address that, that's why they're here. We're not gonna keep them in pain and just do the cleaning first, for example. We have to get them out of pain first. So 
that's where um, in dental school, you're going to definitely learn a lot on how to deal with patients, how to manage patients. And you're going to keep learning that as you go on through your career as a dentist. I learn everything new uh, every day after I see each individual patient. It's like, okay, this patient's upset. Why are they upset? What can I do to make them happy? Maybe this procedure went well. Maybe this one didn't go well. Again, it, it all comes down to communication, how you make the patient feel, um, and how you address their concerns as well. And definitely patient education, because you Main have to thing. reassure the patient that you will get to their chief complaint. You will get them the white teeth that they want. You will do all of that, but you have to show them, you know, this is what's going on. It's for your benefit and explain it to them because if they don't understand, they will be upset. You know, they're going to be like, you know, I came in for this and you're telling me this because there's a lot of, you know, that culture outside that like dentists try to sell treatment, but you have to show them and educate them. It's, that's, it's, that's also your job. It's definitely patient uh, education because again, at the end of the day, some people think of it, these are just teeth. These are not just teeth. These are not just, uh, you know, things that we can just fix like that. This is a, it's, it's an opening into our mouth. It's an entry point into our body, right? So it's, it's a full um, mouth and body connection. You guys will hear that, uh, you know, in the future in dental school, it's a mouth body connection. Uh, it's, it's healthcare. It's not just teeth care, you know? So that's where education, patient, patient education is, is the key. And, um, you know, that's where patient interaction, as far as seeing how many patients you're seeing in dental school, what type of patients you're dealing with, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the demographics there and everything like that. Um, that's where you guys are going to learn. Yeah, doing the dental work sometime, eventually you'll, you'll find out doing the dental procedures becomes the easy part. Managing the patient or patient ed education becomes the, the, the more uh, part that you have to focus on. Alrighty, so let's see. Um, we're gonna do a quick little dental facts for you guys. Um, uh, one thing is, as all of us are probably aware, um, how many adult teeth that we have. Adult teeth are called permanent teeth. Um, adult teeth in dental school, you will learn, they are, um, they are numbered. So each tooth has a significant number to them. Generally, uh, most of us have 32 teeth. That is including our wisdom teeth. And when it comes down to baby teeth, those are called primary teeth. Instead of being numbered, they are, uh, they are lettered. So I have A, B, C, D, so on until the, uh, until the last two. So uh, the one thing I'll also say, the numbering system is a little bit different um, when it comes down to uh, American numbering system is different than European numbering system. So that's a different factor as well, but that's something, you know, you, you guys will learn, in learn in dental school, but all you guys <laughs> will have to just know for right now, there's 32 permanent teeth, and there's 20 baby teeth, uh, primary teeth, and you know, they're distinguished each by either a letter or a number. So, uh, and then the next fact is where is, you guys are gonna, wh when you guys do take dental anatomy, you guys are gonna remember this thing, the cusp of Caravelli. It's the, what is it and where is it located, right? Uh, it's a favorite dental question that every dental anatomy class loves to ask everyone you. will ask you that everyone <laughs> will ask you that you guys will know this on the back of your head uh where is the cusp of carabelli it's on tooth number three and number 14 these are just teeth that you know that, that are numbered uh adult Perfect. teeth as you can tell uh where these teeth are these are the upper first molars so the top jaw the big teeth in the back the first molars that's where the cusp of carabelli is and that's how it looks like it's it's uh, circled on the on the left side right here in the in the red circle Everyone has a little bit of a, of a different size. Some people even don't have them. Um, so, you know, that's a good anatomical uh, uh, thing to note about that particular tooth. Upper first molars have a cusp of carabelli. If you can't remember anything from this presentation, remember just remember that. that. We wanted to school, give you something. So when you go to dental school, you're like, yeah, I remember that. When you guys are going to be taking <laughs> that dental anatomy exam and you're stressed out and this question comes up, you're going to be like, oh, I remember years ago, cusp of Carabelli. <laughs> it might this get tooth. more detailed, but this is a good the, general the, this, way to start. This is a good way to start. <laughs> uh, second thing is another random fact is if someone who's a smoker, um, they actually tend to have, generally speaking, of course, things can vary, but generally speaking, they can have less gum bleeding. The reason for that is the heat from the smoke can actually uh, shrink the capillaries and they can, it actually can mask a gum disease. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a pretty good thing to know as well. If someone's going to be smoking, oh, but my gums are not bleeding, my gums are healthy. But when you look at the radiographs or when you look at clinically, it's otherwise, right? So, so that's a good, good factor to know. That's why one of the reasons why we should quit 
uh, smoking or tell our patients to quit smoking is some of the, the factors like that where masks uh, things which are actually happening. And the last thing, another important factor is uh, saliva neutralizes the, the pH, which is the, the, uh, the acid, uh, yeah, acidity, uh, of the acidity of our mouth. And uh, what that really does is our mouth is a constant battle between acid and basic, acid and basic. So um, what our saliva helps us do is kind of neutralize everything back and prevents cavities from happening in that sense. Yeah, and a lot of medications will cause dry mouth. So if your patient is on a lot of medications, especially like blood pressure medications, you have to know that they are more prone to getting more cavities. So this is something to remember too. So if they yeah. have dry mouth, not a good sign. Yeah, so saliva is the good stuff. Saliva is the good stuff, all right? Um, do you guys have any questions? That's, that's for the most part, that's it as far as uh, things go. Um, first of all, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. That was amazing. Um, we can definitely ask some questions um, if you guys are down for that. Yes, um, 100%. Okay, awesome. Okay, so the first question somebody asked was, um, uh, what if the patient doesn't want treatment? How do you address, uh, how do you address and deal with difficult patients? That's, that's, a, that's a very good question. And that's something, honestly, that happens almost every day, especially in dental school. You have to see, um, you know, if the patient doesn't want a treatment, why don't they want it? Did I not do a good job as a, as a provider, as a dentist, as a doctor to educate them about it? Are finances a key? Um, can they not afford it? Um, you know, you have to see what's the reasoning that they cannot go forward with the treatment. So that's where you will see, okay, how can I, how can I fix that issue for them? And in that sense, sometimes, you know, as a, as a, as a practicing dentist myself, I'm not saying you should be really doing that uh, on a, on a daily basis, but Hey, again, at the end of the day, we are out there to help people. Sometimes, you know, if a, if a patient can afford, you know, a certain treatment, there are, you know, there, there are areas where you can guide them to like dental schools where there are cheaper treatments and finances is the key. There are certain clinics which do free treatments. Uh, sometimes as a dentist, you can volunteer there and help patients, um, you know, guide patients to those free clinics or, or lower cost clinics where you can help them get that treatment done for close to close to uh, zero cost, if, if, if any. Um, so the main thing is dealing with difficult patients is to see why are they that way? Why are they not accepting the treatment? Once you figure that out, you can, you can, you can definitely navigate through that and, and see how you can help them out as well. Yeah. And if after you've educated the patient and they have made their decision, then as long as they understand the risks and benefits, then you've done your job, right? Yeah. But don't assume that they know something. I mean, for example, I actually had a patient, I started a root canal on and I did two. So we split it up into um, like two appointments. And after the second one, like, you know, she could, I couldn't complete it because, you know, time ran out and, you know, it was just a long appointment. Um, she wanted to extract the tooth the next time she came in. Um, I really had to like, you know, explain to her that that is not the smart thing to do. I mean, we've already started, she's already paid for it. So I really had to sit there and educate her and it took that extra time. But at the end of the day, she got it done. And I, if I had just assumed that, you know what, she's, she knows what she's doing she would have, you know, pulled that too. So that's not, you always have to be, you know, like on the cautious, cautious side of things and assume that your patient has not thought about this. Yeah. And definitely, like I said, I mean, it, it comes down to patients don't know what the best uh, way to approach a certain problem is. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's where your part comes in. It's like, Hey, what can I do to help yeah. them? You know? I mean, if you don't know the problem that's going on within yourself, you're not going to know, you're not going to know the depth of it. Right. Yeah. So as a clinician, it's not just your job to do the treatment, but also to educate the patient. And that's very important. They'll tell you that all throughout dental definitely, school. Definitely. And once you have done all of that, then it's up to the patient because yeah. at the end Final of the day, you decision, can't force someone to do something. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Final decision comes down to the patient, but you, you mm -hmm. know, your job is to educate them for mm -hmm. sure. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Our next question. Um, has to do with like dealing with blood. Obviously we're doing dental procedures. There is going to be blood, especially with extractions and stuff and mm -hmm. coming from like undergrad and then going to clinical, it's going to be a tough transition. So how did you guys personally deal with it? And was it hard, easy and, you know, tips with that? Okay. So I am a big germaphobe, <laughs> very big germaphobe. Okay. When I told my parents I wanted to go to dental school, they laughed because they were like, are you, are you serious? Like, what? I'm a big germaphobe. So 
the transition from being in a classroom setting versus a clinical setting, of course, it is a transition, but we do have the protective equipment in the clinics. We have gloves, we have gowns, we have, you know, caps, we have everything that you can to protect yourself, right? You have shields, you have everything. Um, it's not to say that, you know, like you're going to do like a small procedure and blood's going to splatter everywhere. That's obviously not the case. I mean, if you're doing oral surgery or something, maybe here and there, but I mean, definitely like, you know, when you're drilling and stuff, you'll, you'll get splatter, you'll get saliva, you'll get like water splattered on you and stuff. But the thing is you, as long as you're, you're careful of how you are handling it, you know, it's okay. Like, honestly, I always forget that I'm a germaphobe when I'm in there, as long as I know I'm, you know, protecting myself, Mm -hmm. I'm wearing my gloves. I'm making sure that I take off my gloves if I'm touching anything else. So I'm not cross-contaminating. I'm not doing any of that. And honestly, the first thing I do is get in the shower. I do not sit anywhere. I literally throw my scrubs in the laundry and I get in the shower. So, I mean, yeah, it's a transition, but I think I mean, it's not like, oh my God, you're so grossed out that you're going to faint. Like there's so much blood that you're going to faint. Like Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I'm the most like, oh my God, I can go in there and do whatever. But at the same time, like, I think there's a balance and you kind of learn that slowly and Mm -hmm. they don't just throw you in and they're like, okay, here now do a surgery. Like, no, it's, it's slow. You know, you start off with cleanings and you kind of get over the saliva aspect of it. You're like, okay, (laughs) I got saliva in my hair today. Cool. Whatever. You'll get over that. And then you'll slowly get into it. Right. And as long as you're protected, honestly, like that's all it comes down to. Yeah, I mean, especially with everything going on, as you guys are, uh, as we're all yeah. aware, uh, being protected, that's the that's the main key, right? If you're wearing that all that PPE, you guys have the masks on, the the shields, the 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 the, the protective clothing on, everything like that. You know, then then it's it's really almost uh, no factor. And what what mm-hmm. Doctor uh, soon Doctor Jodhi said that. Uh, having the 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 lack of cross contamination that is key because we want to especially nowadays we want to make sure whatever contamination that we get on our clothing or protective gear whatever we leave that within that operatory before we Mm -hmm. step out because otherwise we're going to be transferring it to the next patient or whatever it may be when it comes down to just seeing blood um i wasn't uh really you know phased by it from the beginning i didn't mind it uh, what, uh, what for, for me is not so much seeing something is more. So if I like smell something, oh, that's, yeah. that's where I get more of a, more of a, I don't know, a, a response, I guess you could say. Uh, but I mean, again, with nowadays we're wearing all these masks and N95, I'm, I'm double masking, obviously, uh, just to make sure there's, there's, there's no, uh, aerosol contamination or anything of that sort of sort. So, I mean, the smell factor is never really in the, in the, in the picture anyways, um, but yeah, for me, blood, blood wasn't a, wasn't a huge issue, but again, like, like, like we were just saying, each specialty has a little bit of a different thing. If you're doing, you know, uh, gum and bone special periodontist, or if you're a, a oral surgeon, then yeah, you might be in a more aggressive, uh, area where you might see a lot more bleeding, but if you are an endodontist, uh, you still might general dentist, again, it just all depends on the procedure and everything, but um, that that's where it comes down to you seeing like, okay, is this the right field for me? Is this the right career for me? Mm-hmm. Because yes, you are going to be dealing with saliva. You got, yeah. you got going to be de- dealing with blood on a daily, daily, daily basis. And that's why I actually went into assisting because I was like, it's one thing to yeah. watch someone do it, but it's another mm-hmm. to actually do it. So yourself, that's why yeah. I was like, I need to see before I, you know, commit to this, you know, mm-hmm. career that I don't know if I'll like. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think as long as you're organized and you're clean and you remember not to like, you know, you know, touch everything and whatever, you will be fine for the most part. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know during, especially in dental school, like I know in the real world too, everyone has to like, you know, kind of be on schedule, yeah. but <laughs> in dental school, you are like, oh my God, I have to go set up my room. I have to clean. I have to do everything. So you have to do everything from start to finish. You are your own assistant. So mm-hmm. it kind of gets like, you know, hectic and all the students are going everywhere and doing whatever, but it's so important to remember not to cr- cross contaminate. So as long as you are organized and you're clean, you can, you know, clean you know, prevent that like contamination or if that's what you're worried about. And if you're afraid of like, you know, the phobia of that, slowly you'll get over it. There's a girl in my class. She fainted at everything. Okay. She got over it. She's about to graduate with me. She's doing amazing now. I mean, she's, you will get over the phobia. It's not, and it's not like you're going to be seeing like, you know, open heart surgery. Like (laughs) the most you'll see is like a lot, you know, a gummy bone with like, Mm -hmm. you know, like lots of blood around it and like a flap or something, but 
you don't choose that specialty if you're not super into like you know blood. yeah i mean definitely i know it's a little bit harder to do a physical shadowing right now but you know if you guys mm -hmm. have time available uh work as a dental assistant like soon dr said working mm -hmm. as a dental assistant you will really see it firsthand and that will help you make the decision hey do i want to you know, pursue this career yeah. or maybe this is not for me. So that's an important fact. I think that really helped me realize that, yeah. you know what, it's not that gross. I can do it. Like everyone's like, oh, like mouths, they smell so bad and people don't brush. Everyone mm -hmm. brushes before they come to the dentist. Mm -hmm. They want to trust yeah. you. Yeah. They, they brush. And even if they don't, you are immune to that. You have seen the worst of it in dental school. Everyone flosses. Everyone, <laughs> everyone is an flosser. I mean, I'm guilty of it too. Before we I go are, to a dental, I just have like flossing in the car. I'm like, can I get a brush? <laughs> <laughs> um totally I agree with that one um speaking um of dental assisting um somebody asked how do you become a dental assistant and what was the process of becoming a dental assistant do you need a certification and what are your tips regarding that um that depends on states state um it depends state on what yeah. state you are in so we both actually assisted so I can tell you like what I experienced and what he experienced for me, I wasn't expecting to actually do dental assisting. I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to start shadowing. So I went to my local dentist. I started shadowing her, but I was just like, ask, like at the, after a patient would leave, I'm like, can you explain some things? Cause I'm confused. Mm -hmm. Like I want to know. Right. So she's like, you know what you would benefit from taking the dental assistant course that like, you know, we offer, like you can, you know, do it. And I was like, well, I'm in school and undergrad. So I don't know if I can commit to that. And she's like, well, you will be able to do it at a faster pace so we can put in the program for you. So I did like a quick course. Um, I think I took like a week or two into it and I was like, okay, like they were like, if you want to take the exam and do it, it wasn't really like a formal written hard, like rigorous exam. It was just like the basics of like, you know, dentistry, um, you know, just tools and taking impressions and, you know, things like that. Um, and I did that. And then this guy in my class actually was like, oh, you know, you should apply to dental. Um, like, you know, you should apply to jobs. And I'm like, well, I'm taking a gap year. So why not? So that same day I applied and I got an offer the same day and I went and I interviewed and I got the job and it just worked out for me. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll assist. And I realized I wanted to assist because I wanted to like, you know, you know, be hands-on and try all that, mm -hmm. but I wasn't expecting to just like, you know, get into a job. It kind of like I was thrown in and then I was like, you know what, actually this is better because I can learn. So that's how I went through it and then I had to get certified um to take x-rays I will you can't just take x-rays um even though I took that course I still had to take that but in Virginia you do not need to have a um course or anything that helped me because I wanted to go to dental school but you don't need a course you just need to get certified for x-rays so a lot of people just would you know apply for jobs and they train you on site and you go get certified, they send you somewhere to get certified for x-rays and you're good to go. Yeah, same. I mean, my experience was pretty much similar. Uh, so again, I did dental assisting as well. For me, it was during the process where I was waiting for dental uh, to hear back from dental school and I, and, and I was applying. That was kind of like my gap year while I was waiting and doing interviews. So I was like, well, I want to, you know, I want to worst case scenario, like I said, I applied a little late. So I was like, worst case scenario, if I don't get in this round, what can I do next round to improve my application if i apply with the same thing i've already done that uh, so i was like well let me try to see if there's any dental assisting jobs so uh, i found one i had zero experience in dental assisting i did shadow a couple times before that but nothing hands-on uh, in california you don't you don't need to be a registered dental assistant to do dental mm -hmm. assisting um, as long as, again, depending on the work, they may, they may want you to take some certifications for polishing, for x-rays, if that's what your, your job also involves. Um, but other than that, I would definitely not recommend going through a whole uh, uh, a registered dental assisting program yeah, to just do dental not. assisting because mm -hmm. uh, that is not needed. You guys are going to be honestly spending money and important uh, and uh, very much needed time that you guys should rather spend studying versus yeah. going to a registered dental assisting school because that is not your end goal. Your end goal is dentistry, being a yeah. dentist. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, finding a job, my, my, my dentist uh, who I worked for, I, I still keep in uh, close contact with him. Um, he taught me everything, like everything mm -hmm. from, from scratch. I had no idea how to do anything. I told him, hey, um, I, I have no idea. I'm trying to go into dental school. I'm willing to help. Um, you know, I, I didn't care about money. I didn't care about anything because my goal was, let me just get that experience. Yes. So, um, uh, he taught me everything. I made mistakes. Even as a dental assistant, he would ask for a, Hey, grab me a plastic instrument. 
I had no idea what a plastic instrument is. <laughs> you're uh, not gonna know. You're not gonna know. As Dental assisting is hard. <laughs> it's hard because uh, you're you're actually managing a lot of things all at once. I had no idea, and I I was just kind of held back. I'm like, I don't want to ask him in front of the patients that I don't know. I just grabbed something that I thought was a plastic instrument, but gave it to him. He's like, oh no, that's not it. Went and back. He used to get up in himself. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I went back again, grabbed another instrument. That was not it. He's like, oh no worries, let me tell you what. That's it is. what it gets embarrassing. You're like, oh man, and I don't again, know anything. But again, my my dentist who I was working for, he was very nice. He yeah. was he was like, oh no worries, like he doesn't know. Let me show you. He yeah. showed me once Never plastic learned. instrument isn't even a plastic instrument guys it's a metal <laughs> instrument. so i was confused at that point uh, so again as as you have to see like depending on which job that potentially you you work at as a dental assistant mm-hmm. is the dentist gonna mentor you a little bit yeah uh, of course that is going to be a job uh, mm-hmm. but are they going to mentor you and and help you learn a little bit more uh, about about the field as well? You you have to let them know that you want to go to dental school because even in my office, they did help me and they knew that I was trying to go to dental school. If you don't, if the state you are in does not require you to take a course to be a dental assistant, mm-hmm. I definitely don't recommend going my route. I was just kind of like that kind of fell into my lap. I wasn't trying to go apply to dental, you know, dental assisting positions. I was kind of just like, whatever dental experience I can get. I was like, I have no dental experience. I just need experience. Give me the class. I'll take it. I'll do whatever. Um, And then I got the idea of, you know, doing assisting. But in retrospect, I was like, you know, I could have just applied for jobs. But that was a mistake that I made. But I wouldn't even call it a mistake because I did learn in that class as well. I learned from that. I did learn in that class. So if you have to go that route, that's okay. But if you don't have to, it's not not necessary. necessary. It's definitely not necessary. So I guess like to answer your question, is all your local offices and um, see if you can, you know, apply or if there's any open positions, see what the requirements are for those positions, even if you look online and then try to get those requirements done or call the office and be like, hi, you know, like I'm trying to apply to dental school and I want to assist in the time that I'm waiting. Um, what can I do to, mm-hmm. you know, ha- become, you know, eligible for this job? Yeah. Yeah. They'll help you. Each state is different. Awesome. Um, I think we have time for like one more question. I know we went over, but we have one Sorry. more question. <laughs> we no, both no, 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 it's not you guys. But thank you so much. No, 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 don't no, even worry no. about it. <laughs> um, so our last question, this kind of has to do with, I know it's been a while since you guys applied, not that long, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, with um, personal statements on applying and also letters of recommendation, what kind of tips do you have with writing a personal statement and then um, talking to professors and et cetera for letter of recommendation? So for, I would say for letter of recommendation, let's start off with that one is definitely mm-hmm. finding a, a, a faculty, a professor that you have been working with who do, uh, you know, who, who, who knows, you know, your goals and how, how you were in that class and working closely with them. Definitely finding a faculty who, who, who knows you in that sense, right? So, um, and finding the faculty earlier on just yes. because at the end, when it's time give to apply, time. give them time because they will take their time to write a letter of recommendation. And if it's crunch time, you're like, oh my God, I need to apply like in a week. They might not have that letter in a week. So tell them well in advance, give them time. They have other stuff going on as well. So that's that's my tip as far as letter of recommendation goes is working with the faculty or faculties um, mm-hmm. that, that, that you have been working closely with and giving them a, a, a well- uh, time frame, uh, you know, ahead of time to, to write that letter of recommendation for personal statement. That is a very important thing. Also, um, what I personally did, and, and what I would say as far as personal statements go, is to, to really make that personal statement about you about who you are, because when a dental school picks up that application, they don't know who you are, they don't know what you look like, they don't know what your story is. Your personal statement is a story. It's a story of who you are within a word limit. So you have to really be concise. You have to uh, bring your 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 uh, your your motive forward on on why you're trying to go into this uh, career. Um, I remember talking to one of my professors, um, and I was like, "Well, like I want to go into dental school um, because I want to help people," and he was kind of very. Uh, straightforward with me. He's like, well, you can help people do anything. You can help people at the grocery store. Why, why dentistry? Right. So I have to be a little bit more uh, like, you know, uh, more, more, more informative about that. How do I want to help people? Like, how do I want to uh, kind of pursue dentistry and, and what, what changes I want to make into it as well. 
Yeah. And I think like you, okay, don't just think, don't write what you think like, okay, the school is going to love this, right? What really is your story? Don't be afraid to tell them that, you know, this is what I was thinking or dentistry wasn't always my passion. I picked up on it, you know, at this point in my life, I actually wrote about like, you know, how I always wanted to be a physician. I wanted to follow my dad's footsteps. That's what I wanted. I knew I wanted that up until I got to college and I really shadowed and I really saw that like you know what the day-to-day life for a physician is like and I realized that that wasn't for me and I wasn't instinctively like oh yeah I'm not doing pre-med anymore I'm doing dentistry even though yes people do do that and there's nothing wrong with that either but that was not my instinct I was like I don't I was lost I was like I don't know what I'm going to do um and one of our family friends actually kept recommending like, oh, why don't you try to shadow? Why don't you try to see if you want to go to dentistry? And I was like, I told you guys, I'm a germaphobe. I'm like, nope, I don't think so. <laughs> but I tried it, right? Because I was like, I, I mean, it doesn't hurt to try. I'll see what I like. I wrote exactly that. I told them exactly what happened, where in my life I realized that I wanted to go to dental school. Because if everyone goes saying, you know, I woke up one day and I dreamt of going to dental school, I knew from when I was a kid, that's not necessarily always true for everyone. If that's true for you, go ahead, write that. But don't just write what you think is going to be, you know, looking picture perfect, write your story. And they will like that because they have read a lot of papers. They've read a lot of personal statements. They know it has to be something different, something that stands out that once they put down that application, they're like, oh, wow, I remember that story. And that can be your story. And it could be anything. Just write it from from the, from your heart. Yeah. And, and And what happened uniquely to you. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. story is different. Everyone's yeah. personal statement is different. I mean, I was I the first student that ever went from pre-med to pre-dent? Mm-hmm. Definitely not. Mm-hmm. But I wrote exactly my journey and where I realized. Mm-hmm. Write that as opposed to, you know, oh my God, like I just, you know, realized that like teeth were just like way better than, you know, <laughs> don't write. Don't and, write like and, and also I would say definitely work closely with uh the professors. There's a lot of good professors in mm-hmm. in, in undergraduate schools that mm-hmm are really, really, really good at writing personal statements, mm-hmm. show it to them as much as you can. Yes. I, I, I had a really good professor. Um, he, I, I would send him like three paragraphs. He would put it down in the same thing. He would concise it down to like less than yeah. a half a paragraph. And I'm like, how did you just do that? <laughs> right? So again, cause you are fighting a word limit. Mm-hmm. So Mm-hmm. Yeah. work with professors they are they are the best source that you guys have yeah definitely have people read over it yes so many times awesome thank you so much um dr bay and um student dr Chaudhry, so much for this amazing presentation and q a session um that is all for today everyone watching um thank you so much once again well, thank oh, yeah. you for having us. Thank you for yeah, tuning thank in. You guys. Thanks. Sorry thanks. for going over. Yeah. No, no, don't even, don't worry about it. But yeah. thanks everyone so, for, for coming in. For yeah. Sure. And if you have any questions, feel free mm-hmm. to either DM us or, um, you know, whatever. You yeah, can reach out to you us. Uh, that's our Instagram page. Reach out to us. Ask us any questions, uh, dental school process anything even yeah. when you guys are in dental school if you guys have any questions yeah feel we're free. always ready we're, we're always